to start with a version of uh, the, the question that is the title of this forum. Um, so everyone probably saw the poster. What would you do if you had only one week to live? Um, but I want to open this up a bit. So first of all, I don't think that uh, there's anything special about a week. Um, could be a month, a year, 10 years. Um, and more generally, of course, uh, in the background of all of this is the fact that we all do, in fact, have only a limited amount of time. Um, I think most of us don't know how much, uh, hopefully longer than a week, um, but it's, it's limited. And so the general version of that question temporally opened up is, what, how do you live your life knowing that you only have so much time? Um, I also want to say that uh, I don't think the question here is uh, specifically about what two of you would do if you discovered that you only had a week or a month to live. Um, as I often tell my students about all of the questions we ask in my classes, this, like, all of the philosophical questions that we talk about in philosophy, these are questions you have to answer for yourselves. So the position that we're all in is that we do, in fact, have to answer this, every single one of us. Uh, and I think what's unique about the two of you is that you have backgrounds and expertise and experience that puts you in a position to tell us quite a bit about what kinds of things a person, whoever they are, might want to be thinking about when they're thinking about these kinds of questions. Um, and I think this can include whether it is only a week or a month or a year. Um, and I think, Lydia, you have a lot of relevant experience about these kinds of things, um, more than I do, thankfully. Um, and I think, Tim, you have a different kind of perspective on these kinds of questions about, like, um, I mean, one thing I find sort of fascinating is uh, the fact that it does seem to make a big difference how long it is. Uh, Lydia was telling me at dinner that there's a chapter of your book, um, which I only got yesterday, so I haven't finished reading it yet. Uh, and this is a late chapter um, about like asking or t telling college students at a certain point, like, your college, you're going to be done with college in six weeks. How do you feel about that? Uh, and I think it's sort of curious that there's such a difference between doing that with only six weeks left and doing it with like six months left or three years left. Um, and, you know, I think you should both feel free to answer this question however you see fit given what you know, but those are some things that kind of occurred to me as I was thinking about the title question and um, sort of reading the beginnings of both of your, your books in the last day. I'm so impressed you read that much of the book and then you just got it, so I just have to acknowledge that. That's pretty amazing. So. Airplane writer. Oh, airplane writer, right, that's good. Um, well, so you, you, you kind of alluded to what I do with my, I just did this two weeks ago with the students. I remind them, and I, when I'm developing my positive psych class, I'll always sort of move around the topics, but the very first thing when I'm developing the course is I count six back, six weeks from graduation date, and whatever that day is, that's when I develop that lecture on the time paradox and how our interaction with time um, and how we savor time depends on the knowledge of the impending end of something. Um, and there's researchers who, who have done this. And I think that it's important for us to acknowledge the impermanence of life. Any time that we, that we recognize that what we have is not gonna last forever, um, although it can be difficult to internalize that, we also know that just from like a, a, an economic perspective, the reason why when you go onto Amazon, they'll say only three of these things remaining is because when something becomes a scarce resource, its value increases. Um, and, and marketers know that, which is why they often use that kind of language when they're trying to sell us a product. But it's also the case that in our own lives, when we become aware of our impermanence, at least on Earth, that, that changes how we interact with things. It puts things into a proper perspective. So that's the reason I do that activity, and I always get mixed reviews. This year, I've seen a couple of the students in the class, they were actually like, thank goodness, only six weeks. But some years, the students have been like angry. One year, a student said, I hate you. And I was like, did someone just say, I hate you? And the student said, yeah, I did. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. So this is just a fact. I, I think, though, that for me, I mean, I try to live my life in a way where I, we, none of us are promised tomorrow. So, you know, I try to be mindful of that. Am I always mindful of that? Of course not. Um, but I, I think that if I only had a week left, you know, I, I would want to spend as much time as I could with my loved ones. 
And I would probably spend a lot of time writing gratitude letters to people who had impacted me um, and let them know how much they mean to me. Um, but when I reflect on that, I'm also grateful that that's not too different from how I actually live my life. I think that that's one of the things I try to do anyway. I have not recently been given a terminal diagnosis, but when, I mean, I regularly write gratitude letters to people who have had an impact on me. You know, one of the most important people in my life passed away last fall, unexpectedly. And I was heartbroken by it, but I took solace in knowing that there was nothing left unsaid. That it, he was actually my mentor in graduate school, hugely influential in my life. But as, as sad as I remain that, that, that he's no longer here, I, I regularly let him know how much he meant to me and how influential he was in my life. And so I try to incorporate that into my living. So I think I would probably heighten that a little bit more. I probably, you know, wouldn't be going into work that week. I'd be, you know, writing gratitude letters and spending time with my buddies. But, um, but I, I try to do that anyway. And I think that that's how I try to live. You know, I think there's a song about that, Live Like You Were Dying. I, and I, and I, I'm not, I don't embody that song perfectly, but I do try to spend time with people, prioritize relationships, and express gratitude to those who have been impactful in my own life. Yeah, that's great. When you open up the question, Nick, from one week to just sort of recognizing that we're mortal, uh, it's really easy, I think, then to lose perspective, right? The one week really brings things into sharp focus. Okay, the clock is ticking. It starts now. What am I going to do, right? To whom am I going to express gratitude? Who do I want to be with? Uh, what do I want to read? What, how do I want to spend my time? The minute you uh, sort of make it indefinite, I think it's really easy to lose track of the fact that we all face our finitude. Um, and this is something I see all the time in the clinic and in the hospital, right? Patients who are well aren't often thinking about their mortality. They just aren't, right? It's something that isn't perhaps the most pleasant thing to dwell on. And uh, frankly, people want to just think about their living. And I, I would hazard a guess that that's true of most college students as well. Then the, the fatal diagnosis, the terminal diagnosis, the, 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 the scare can change everything. Um, I, I gravitate towards Tim's perspective, uh, but for different reasons. My, my reasons are more related to uh, having so many patients my age, having cared over the, over the course of the past 20 years for so many patients my age who have received these terrible diagnoses. And I think, well, why is it me sitting here as the doctor, healthy, and you, my same age, as the one who is now facing her death, his death, right? What, why is it that we're on opposite sides of this table, and yet it, it could have been different? And in light of seeing so much um, death and, and, and sickness and death, uh, that kind of prompted me then to think about how do I want to live with intention, right? So how do we live with an eye to our mortality, with an eye to our finitude, without getting sort of obsessed and caught up in, in the morbid aspect of death, um, but, but doing it in a way that allows um, what's most important to us to come into relief. And I think that's what he characterized. So, so if it's, if it's um, more than a week, uh, can we still live as though it were a week? Uh, and, and, and what would that look like? I think it's a challenge, but I also think it's a practice that all of us can uh, habituate ourselves to, that we can, we can get into the habit of thinking about what matters most and how will we really live each day, let those people know each day, um, engage in the tasks of, of living well um, in a way that, um, that, that makes the most of the time that we have. So I think it's pretty similar to what you said. Tim. And I think you used a really important word there that we habituate. I mean, when you look at the science of happiness, you know, there's a term that we use, hedonic adaptation, but it's that we very quickly and easily adapt to what we have, and we very quickly and easily take for granted what we have. And I think included in that can be time, that we take that for granted. And sometimes it is those reminders that are unexpected that sort of um, force us to, to, to confront the reality um, that there's nothing that's guaranteed, that, that, um, that we, we can't take things for granted because nothing really is. And I think, I mean, you might say, Nick, that the ancients, I mean, one of the things they were about was cultivating the virtues, right? So habits or habituating is another way of describing cultivating virtue, cultivating a virtue of gratitude, of living with intention, 
I don't know if you want to expand on that, but. I do have a sort of follow-up question that that like ties into really nicely. Um, when I was in graduate school, I spent uh, kind of enormous amount of time thinking about this concept from Aristotle. Um, the Greek word is energia, which is the source of our energy. But it seems to me in Aristotle, at least according to my teachers, um, something like activity, where the idea of this seems to be that um, an activity in this sense is the kind of thing that can never be completed. So it's contrasted in the usual vocabulary of the process, which is the kind of thing that like is progressing towards some goal, where once you've gotten the goal, you're done. And one of the things that Aristotle seems to think is that life is an activity in this sense. Um, in particular, living well. And I think when I teach ethics, I sometimes talk about this, that like happiness is not the kind of thing where like you work for a while towards it and then you get there and then you're done. And you're just like, ah, I'm happy now. What shall I do next? It's a thing that you like are constantly engaged in. Um, and so living a happy life for Aristotle is part of like doing things happily. Uh, and I have a question about like what this means. Um, in connection with something that you both said about, I think I'm gonna get the cliche version of this, which is like, live every day like it's your last. Because I'll confess that I have always kind of hated this as a way of thinking, but it occurs to me that maybe I just misunderstood it. Uh, because one way, on one way of hearing it, it's like, well, I'm not gonna worry about things like making money uh, I mean, I don't even really have to worry about eating anymore <laughs> if I've only got a day. Um, I can, like, throw caution to the wind and do all these things. But, like, obviously, if I'm going to live more than one day, that's not smart. Um, so in practice, I just, like, it's not wise to live every day like it's your last. Um, but another way of thinking about this that was suggested to me, I think, by things that you both were saying is, is that and I think this would fit with Aristotle's idea of an activity, what if you could arrange your life in such a way that were you to discover that you were going to die in a week, you didn't have to change anything. That like the way you were living your life was one where the thing to do, knowing you had only a week left, was exactly the thing you were already going to do. Yeah. Um, and it strikes me that like, if you're doing that, then you know you're living the good life. Like you're doing it right. Yeah, I, I would say, I can't speak for Tim, but I think I'm going to speak for Tim too. I think that's what we were both saying. The second, not the first. Um, maybe I'll just rip off of that for a quick second and say that in, in my work, uh, I was really interested. So I've had all of these patients die these sort of terrible deaths. Their family members have come back to me and said, you know, the way our mother died in the intensive care unit is, is something we never want to see again. That was terrible. Um, family members saying uh, she wasn't ready. She never made her peace. I've heard statements like this so often, and so that, for me, even as a medical student, got me thinking about why, why are patients dying so poorly? If you have your whole life to live knowing that you're going to die, why is it that people are not really uh, facing up to their mortality over the course of their living? And so I, I sort of was wrestling with this as a medical student and then as a resident, and then I, I stumbled across this genre of literature called the Ars Moriendi, and this was a, Ars Moriendi is Latin for the art of dying. And it's a genre of literature that, the premise of it was this, uh, if you want to die well, you have to live well. That is the art of dying and the art of living well are very much intertwined. Uh, so it's not so much, um, you know, like seize the day kind of mentality, throw caution to the wind, but let me live into the fullness of the life I want to live. Let me flourish today. Uh, let, me, let me begin cultivating today the kind of character that I want to be known for uh, when I die. Right? So in the late Middle Ages, when uh, plague was sweeping across Western Europe, people, all kinds of people died sort of unexpectedly. And, and I guess we saw this a little bit in COVID, right? Not on quite the same scale at all. But when you have one third or two thirds of the population dying from plague, suddenly people are going to their deathbeds 
uh, with a kind of character that was uh, not at all how they wanted to be remembered. And that's what really triggered the genre of literature. You don't want to go down being known as an angry, hostile, greedy man. Then think about what it means to be generous, to be patient, to be gentle, to be kind, and start cultivating today those sorts of character traits, those habits, uh, so that you live that way, right? None of us is perfect, we fail all the time, we're constantly having to start again, but you live that way and you make it a habit, you make it a pattern of life, so that in the end, when you die, you are, you are that kind of person even in your dying. And so I, I think I'm with you. On the second second option. As you were saying that, um, it reminded me of something that another one of my mentors here. So I've been at WashU for a long time because I was a student here, or with undergrad and grad school, and then um, this is where I spent my career. So I've been at WashU for 22 years, and one of my mentors, who's been consistent all 22 all 22 of those years, is actually Father Gary Brown from the Catholic Student Center. And I remember that one of the things that he shared with me, because as a priest, he's often called on when people are in their final hour or they get the terminal diagnosis, often people will go to a religious or spiritual leader. And so he's walked with people during their final weeks or months. And that's one of the things that he has emphasized. Um, he says that the way that we live is the way that we die. And I think that he's exactly capturing your sentiment there, and I don't mean to speak on his behalf, because I think that that phrase could be taken in many different ways, but I've heard him say it a couple of different times in different contexts, and what I always took from it is that, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the behaviors and the mindsets that we bring into our living, in the, the ups and the downs, that's part and parcel of, of our lives, it's just inevitably there are going to be good moments and bad moments, and the extent to which we're able to savor those good and even look for the silver linings and through the adversity, and also our ability to persevere and to keep going even when times are tough, and to have a robust social network that we can draw upon to be with us, that that becomes especially salient in our final moments. And I think that to the extent to which we can incorporate those habits into our lives, when we don't have the diagnosis, eventually one day we will, and many of us will, and, and then it's important to, I think, know how to carry that into it when we are given you know, only so much time left um, for, for life. And that's one of the things that you know, people often ask, what, what, you know, because I study happiness, they'll say, so what do I need to do to be happy? What's, what's the secret of happiness? And I think that oftentimes people are looking for like a wow factor, some big splashy thing. But if anything, the wow factor is that there is no wow factor to happiness. It's not about you know, some big huge vacation or the big salary or the title or moving into the big house, but it's really about the accumulation of those small, daily, I like the word to use, intentional behaviors that we incorporate into our living that over time contributes to a sense of well-being. And I think that we then have the potential then to bring that into one day for all of us our dying. And you, Nick, had asked, I think the second part of your earlier question was what sort of uh, things, what sort of factors need to come into this conversation about living well at the end of life. Uh, I'm, I don't know how you exactly said it, but that's the way I remembered it. And you just brought up a couple of things, right? You brought up community, and I know that's something that both of us in our, in our books talk about the importance of community, and we were talking about this over dinner, the loneliness problem, the impact of social media. Uh, one of the things that I often tell people when I'm speaking about my own work is that central to living well and dying well is nurturing relationships. And sometimes I give people a thought experiment. I say, tell me who you would want at your deathbed. If you, if you think about you get the diagnosis and it's, it's not good, uh, who's going to be surrounding you? Almost everybody says they want to die at home surrounded by their loved ones. And most people actually don't die at home. But uh, well, let's just go with that. You're at home surrounded by your loved ones. Who are those loved ones? What family members or friends are surrounding you? And then I ask people, okay, so what is the state of those relationships now? What are you doing to nurture those relationships? And one time, a guy in the audience raised his hand and he said, well, I know who I want at my deathbed, I just can't stand the guy right now. Um, can I wait to work on that relationship? And you know, it's funny, it's a silly question though, right? Because none of us knows what day we're going to die. But how much 
stronger, how much richer, how much deeper will those relationships be at the end, whenever the end arrives, if we are intentional, right, about nurturing those relationships over the course of our living. And uh, so certainly relationships are one, the habits, the character traits that we cultivate. And I would say, so I, I come at this in part uh, from the Christian tradition, and one of the things that I think about both as a person of faith and as someone who has cared for many patients who are facing their deaths, and maybe your, your priest mentor also uh, would have comments on this, is sometimes these religious questions come up for my patients. And, you know, I, I don't know what I believe. I've never really thought about it. I'm facing my death, and I, I don't know, you know, and it's sort of, uh, it, well, it would be bad to say a Hail Mary to call the chaplain, but it's kind of a Hail Mary to call the chaplain, right? Somebody get this person help it, but my point in bringing this up is we think about what does it mean to live well in order to die well? Um, par part of living well, I think, is, is attending to these questions um, while you're still able, because I've certainly cared for patients who were not able to think clearly uh, at the end of their lives. So it's just good, good to wrestle with this stuff, and there's no better place than college, really.